Learning Objective 12-8 is to understand some other issues related to foreign operations, including hedging and net investment in the foreign subsidiary. And I, I haven't, I actually, I really like hedging a net investment in a foreign subsidiary. Whenever I say hedging, I think I scare a lot of people after the last chapter, chapter 11, but I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, let's go into some of these topics. These are miscellaneous topics. The way to think about these is they're kind of CPA exam material. So, parent company consolidates a foreign sub except when following the conditions are so severe that the U.S. company doesn't have sufficient economic control. So, if there's restrictions on foreign exchange, restrictions on transfers of property, or other governmentally imposed uncertainties, it could mean that the parent does not have control of the sub, even if the parent owns more than 50%, and therefore, it does not need to be consolidated anymore, and it'll be presented as a separate line item on the balance sheet in the income statement. So instead of consolidating, you'll have one line, investment in foreign subsidiary. Um, as long as the company has the ability to exercise significant influence, it can still, it still and should use the equity method. And in that case, it's going to need to remeasure, translate, maybe both, depending on whatever the deal is with the functional currency. Um, but if you can't apply the equity method, you would use the cost method. A foreign investment, when it's liquidated, um, what you would do is you would take everything you put in the shoebox, other comprehensive income, take it out and put it into income. So if you've been running a sub for a long time, you've been accumulating a lot of gains and losses into the shoebox, other comprehensive income, accumulated other comprehensive income items. When you liquidate the sub, whether you sell it or you close it, whatever happens, you lose ownership of the sub for whatever reason, then all those gains and losses come out of the shoebox. Because remember, the shoebox is really just a temporary place. Items go into the shoebox for a little while until they're going to be realized, like unrealized gains and losses on certain unavailable for sale investment securities. They go into the shoebox until you sell them and they become realized. And it's going to be the same thing for pension adjustments um, and hedging adjustments, of course. So in those situations, the shoebox is a temporary place. And whenever you sell the sub, these gains and losses come out and they go into income. Now, if you never sell the sub, then, you know, you never have to do that. Now, what you can do, this is really cool. We've been talking about hedging and it's a major problem for companies that a foreign investment is denominated, their functional currency is foreign currency. And therefore, Everything that happens in that investment is going to be directly affected by the exchange rate between the functional currency of the sub and the functional currency of the parent. So if the value of the exchange rate declines, then everything that happens in that sub is going to decline. The balance sheet value is going to decline and the income is going to decline also. If you're remeasuring, then you're going to have gains and losses too. hit your income statement, not just OCI. But you will have OCI adjustments anyway, and those can be quite high. So if you have a major devaluation of a foreign currency, um, we saw some major drops in the British pound last year. Those could have a tremendous impact on your financial statements. And it's not uncommon for multinational companies to show very high gains and losses for show very high gains and losses as a result of foreign currency transactions over which they have no control. So it's extremely, this is a dangerous area. And what you can do is actually pretty cool. The really cool thing here is that you can hedge these investments very, very easily and effectively. And we've gone into the complications of how to hedge things in the past in the last chapter and you're probably still traumatized from that but this hedge is really simple and easy and the FASB allows you to do it in a way that 
is it, it just works. So a parent can hedge a foreign currency translation gain or loss on an investment. And it can go to OCI to the extent of the hedge is effective. And all you have to do is take on a liability, borrow money in the functional currency of the investment. And to the extent that the functional cur the amount of the loan, the liability is equal to the net assets of the investment or your investment, then that's the extent that the hedge is going to be effective. It's really amazing because if the asset goes up in value, so will the liability and that's it. And one increase is going to offset the other. So let's say Peerless owns 100% of German's net assets, 50,000 euro, and then Peerless borrows 50,000 euro at an interest rate of 5%. Um, let's record the journal entries. To borrow the money, you just debit cash, obviously, 50,000 euro. And actually, I should do this 50,000. And you credit loan payable euro 50,000. On December 31st, you, you've got, um, you've got to write up this loan payable because the, its value is increased by, wait, wait, I got the, I have the value wrong here. This is going to be equal to, um, 50,000 euro times the exchange rate of a dollar twenty or sixty thousand because we're in dollars right and then by year end this is going to be worth let's see um it's going to be worth seventy thousand dollars so you have there a ten thousand dollar increase in the loan payable so you've got to write up your loan payable Euro by ten thousand seventy thousand minus sixty thousand is going to be ten thousand dollars, and debit other comp. This can go to other comprehensive income. Ten thousand dollars, and that'll offset the gain that you're recording to other comprehensive income on your asset. Now you've also got interest expense. The interest itself doesn't. It doesn't doesn't also go into the hedge, unfortunately. So you've got here an interest payable. This is going to go at the average rate. So this is going to be 50,000 times 5% times average of $1.30. Or thirty-two fifty. So sorry, that's not interest payable. Interest pay interest expense. Is going to be fifty thousand times five percent times the average rate of a dollar thirty, and then the interest payable is going to go at the year end rate because that's the actual amount I have to pay. I have to pay 50,000 times 5% times a dollar 40 or 3,500. And the difference between these is going to be another loss. Of $250. Then December 31st, I got to do my, um, my closing journal entries. So this other comprehensive income of $10,000 is going to be close to accumulated other
of ten thousand dollars and then I've got to close this foreign currency translation loss translation is really a misnomer it's more of a foreign currency exchange loss because we're not really doing a translation we've been talking about translation all day this would go to retained earnings because it goes right to income of 250 so what would happen is that as the value of the investment floats, so too would the value of the debt offsetting it float. And therefore, any increases in the debt would, or decrease in the debt, the gains or losses of those from those will go to other comprehensive income, just like the investment itself. And now there's an additional thing here because of some kind of provision of the loan. Um, are they going to pay off the loan payable on January 1st? So debit loan payable for $70,000. Debit interest payable for $3,500. And credit cash for the sum. $73,500. A few other important notes. These are CPA questions, really. There are multiple choice questions on the CPA exam, and they're worth knowing. Um, you need to show your aggregate foreign transaction gain or loss on your income statement or somewhere in your notes. And what a lot of companies will do is they'll aggregate the gains and they'll aggregate the losses and then offset them to show the net. So you show total gains, total losses, and offset them. And this could be also just written in a one sentence footnote. Your statement of cash flows also needs to be restated into US dollars using the same rates. And you can make a balancing item for the differences in the statement of cash flows. And it says here, can be analyzed and traced the specific accounts to generate the difference. Under measurement, lower of cost of market inventory valuations need to be done as if they had been done at the historic rate. So the historic cost of inventories must be remeasured using historical exchange rates to determine the functional currency historical cost value. So if you're going to use lower of cost of market, which you require to use, you need to use remeasured amounts using the functional currency rather than the original amounts using the book currency. So you would remeasure the cost, the market, and the um, the market price minus the selling costs, and you know the ceiling and the floor and that kind of thing. All needs to be done using the functional currency and not the original currency. And let's say a company has a foreign currency denominated receivable from a foreign subsidiary. Those need to be equal in order for your consolidation to work. So U.S. company has to revalue the receivable to its U.S. dollar equivalent as of the date of the financial statements. And then afterwards, the receivable should be the same as the dollar value so they can be eliminated when you do your consolidation. But it's very forward that they be equal. Now, when intercompany foreign currency transactions are not expected to be settled within the foreseeable future, they can be considered part of the investment in the foreign entity. And this avoids problems in those intercompany payables and receivables. So these can be included in the investment itself. It's really a receivable from the investment, but it's construed to be part of the investment. And what this does is it defers the gains or losses on the receivables and payables that would um, start to accumulate. It simplifies the accounting a lot. And these things create interperiod tax allocation problems. <laughs> so when you have temporary differences in recognizing revenues and expenses between income and taxes, that obviously creates deferred tax problems. So exchange gains and losses from foreign currency transactions require recognizing sometimes deferred tax asset or liability. And because they're being included in income, but they might not be recognized for tax purposes yet. 
and therefore you would need to create a tax deferral for any translation adjustment that's being recognized in income but not yet being recognized for tax purposes. And you could have it in the other direction also. Now, if undistributed earnings are indefinitely reinvested in a subsidiary, then they don't need to be recognized as undistributed earnings and they not deferred. You don't have to recognize the tax on those. So in other words, if you're a foreign subsidiary that's earned income and you haven't yet paid U.S. taxes on it, of course, you're going to consolidate that income. But there's a question. If you ever take the money back into the United States, then it becomes taxable. So the question is, is that a deferred tax liability or not? You've recognized the taxes for U.S. You recognize the income. And one day you're going to take this money back into the United States and have to pay taxes on it. The rule is that if you don't intend to bring the money back to the United States, then it's not a deferred tax liability and you don't have to record. It's not a temporary difference at all. If you make a decision to repatriate that income, it's called patriate that income and bring the money back to the United States, then it becomes taxable. It's a temporary difference until you actually bring it back to the United States and pay taxes on it. And you have all sorts of weird situations that could come up, including many situations that involve three currencies. You have the original currency that the books are kept in, but it's not the functional currency. You remeasure into the functional currency, and then you translate into the parent's functional currency. What you could also have, and my friend Damien Riedemeyer loves this example. He's got an example where company... Um, the books were kept in dollars, but the functional currency was, I think, Swiss francs. And then, of the sub, that is. So they needed to remeasure from U.S. dollars into Swiss francs. The parent company was in the United States. So they needed to translate back into dollars. So they went from dollars, remeasured into Swiss francs, and then translated back into dollars. Pretty cool example, right? Because you would say, well... Is there any difference? Yeah, there's going to be a big difference because remeasurement and translation are not the same thing. So there's going to be huge differences offsetting each other and the remeasurement is going to put all this stuff into income and the translation is going to put all the stuff into OCI. And it's a lot of work um, to get those numbers just right. 